You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Welcome to this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. And as normal, I'd like to start off with a shout out to our new listeners. And this week we have new listeners in London, Birmingham, Cardiff, Southampton, Swansea, Chelmsford, Portsmouth, Guildford, Bristol, Manchester, Nottingham, Newcastle upon Tyne, and then across in the continent, we have uh, new listeners this week in Attica in Greece. And we also welcome new listeners from Volgograd in Russia, from Sheba in Japan, and then a whole host of new listeners this week from our friends across the pond in the USA, where we have new listeners in California, Connecticut, Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. So a big shout out to all our new listeners and always a warm welcome to all my regular listeners. Uh, I really appreciate all of you who take half an hour out of your week to catch up on the latest to do with GDPR and data security. And uh, this week we have once again have another packed episode for you. Just a reminder, if you have any comments about the program or you have any thoughts on what you'd like me to cover in the future or items you'd like me to cover in more depth or even people perhaps you'd like me to interview on the program then please do let me know and the best way to do that is to send an email to podcasts at insurity.co.uk or check out the podcast page on the www.insurity.co.uk website that's e-n-s-u-r-e-t-y dot co.uk So in just a few moments, I'll be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, we have uh, news about fines imposed by the ICO on Aaron Banks and Leave.eu and one of Aaron Banks' company's Alden Insurance. We have an article about B&Q and how its attempt to um, publicise shoplifters actually landed it on the wrong side of the GDPR regulations itself. Uh, so news that Google in France is to appeal its 50 million euro fine, which we reported on last week. A quick update on Facebook in Europe. And then an article in response to one of our listeners who contacted us regarding the right to be forgotten. So we explain a bit more about the right to be forgotten and why in a number of instances the right to be forgotten is really no right to be forgotten at all. And finally for this week we have, have some news of a Portuguese hospital group who have been fined €400,000 for having an insecure IT system and therefore potential data breaches in the eyes of the Portuguese ICO. So, a wide variety of articles as normal on this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. Here in the UK, of course, Brexit continues to rumble on. And uh, this week, uh, the ICO has come back into the spotlight with uh, their investigation into Aaron Banks and his Leave.eu campaign, which operated during the period up to the uh, referendum in 2016. Um, He's now been fined uh, by the ICO a total of £120,000 for data protection violations during the referendum campaign. Um, the ICO had announced back in November that it intended to fine Aaron Banks and the insurance company which he runs, Alden Insurance, um, and it's now gone ahead and done that. And as we say, it, it's fined them £120,000, so a considerable sum. Um, Leave.eu itself was fined £15,000 for using Alden Insurance customers' details unlawfully to send almost 300,000 political marketing messages and a further £45,000 for its part in sending an Alden marketing team to political subscribers. 
um, with and uh, Alden itself was also fined £60,000 for the latter violation. The fine for Leave.eu's marketing campaign was 15000 less than the ICO had initially proposed back in November because the regulator took account of representations made by the company. One mitigating factor was that the ICO had not received any actual complaints about the contravention, it said. Overall, the referendum campaign sent more than 1 million emails to subscribers that contained a banner advertising 10% of insurance that one of Alden's brands goes chippy. More seriously, perhaps, it sent almost 50,000 emails out after the referendum titled Skippy Saves the Day, once again offering a 10% discount. The campaign negligently dis- disobeyed electronic marketing regulations in doing so, the ICO found. In a statement, Elizabeth Denham, the Information Commissioner, said it is deeply concerning that sensitive personal data gathered for political purposes was later used for insurance purposes and vice versa. This should never have happened. We have been told both organisations have made improvements and learned from these events, but the ICO will now carry out a further audit of these organisations to determine how they are using customers' personal information. And so the ICO has now said that it's going to begin a full audit of Aldon and Leave.eu's joint offices, staff and records looking for evidence of whether or not the two companies followed data protection guidelines in processing personal information, how they trained staff about data protection and what policies and procedures they had in place. The results of that audit, which will include interviewing the directors and staff, will be made public. Perhaps in a warning shot across the bowels of uh, Aaron Banks and Aldon, the ICO said it is a criminal offence to obstruct an ICO audit or destroy information covered by it. In a separate investigation, Leave.eu has already been investigated by the National Crime Agency over a multi-million pound donation the Electoral Commission believes comes from Rock Holdings, one of the bank's companies that is based in the Isle of Man, and as such not legally allowed to fund campaigns in UK elections. Um, We've approached Leave.eu and Alden Insurance and ended Alan Banks for comment, and we've not yet received one, but if we do, we'll bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The hardware and uh, DIY group B&Q found itself on the uh, wrong side of the law regarding GDPR this uh, week in what is probably best described as the law of unintended consequences. Um, The DIY chain had put details of suspected shoplifters using images from its CCTV um, out onto the uh, social media channels. And uh, they really shouldn't have done that because the images, of course, on CCTV, as we explained last week, are now covered under GDPR. And uh, they also found that uh, they had exposed records including potentially 70,000 offender and incident logs. Um, And what happened was that as a result of this published on social media, a data security expert um, managed to pick up some of this data, dig a bit deeper, and he managed to gain access to some logs um, of activity at B&Q and in particular he said that he could find the first and last names of the individuals caught or suspended of or suspected of stealing goods from stores, descriptions of the people involved, their vehicles and other incident related information, the product codes of the goods believed to have been shoplifted and the value of the associated loss. One example of the details for example um, read, offender ran out of the fire exit with Nest thermostats. The mail on this occasion got away. There is no CCTV footage covering this area. Uh, the person who found this data said the data was tapped on an elastic search server, an open source search engine technology that had not been set up to require user ID authentication. 
A spokesman for B&Q said it believed the number reported in the blog was inaccurate and that there were a number of other inaccuracies, but declined to say what they were. Interestingly, the B&Q spokesman said, our continuing investigation will help us decide whether an ICO notification is required because there were no reports that the database had been accessed by any other non-authorised party other than this uh, data security individual. However, given the volume of records affected and the nature of the data and the CCTV images, I have to say that from my perspective as a GDPR practitioner, I find it very hard to understand how B&Q can think there is any reason why they shouldn't report this to the ICO. And given that they're now aware of it, of course, they now, the 72 hours, they started counting down. So it'd be very interesting to see if in the next day or so, um, B&Q do report this to the ICO. And if they don't, then it'll be something which I hope the ICO does follow up. And we will doubtless come back to this in a future edition of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you were listening to last week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, you'll probably remember me talking about Google receiving a whopping great 50 million euro fine from the French ICO, the CNIL. It's perhaps no great surprise, given the size of the fine, that Google has chosen to take up its option to appeal against the fine, and it's taking the appeal to the Court of Justice of the European Union, and so that's probably delayed it for at least six months, if not a year, um, given the speed with which the Court of Justice tends to work, but nonetheless, Google's perfectly entitled to take the case to the Court of Appeal. And the main reason for their appeal is that they're saying they had worked hard to create a transparent and straightforward GDPR consent process and was concerned about the impact of this ruling on publishers, original content creators and tech companies in Europe and beyond. Um, interesting, they're not claiming they're worried about their own reputation, but about the reputation of others, which is very kind of Google. Anyway, Back to the subject in hand, um, they're saying that consent is easy to give and that they believe that the standards are correct and they've applied them correctly. Uh, CNIL, the French ICO, doesn't agree. It said that consent is not valid because it isn't unambiguous or specific. The choice for personalisation is a pre tick box, which of course is not allowed under GDPR, and users must give full agreement to the terms and services and data processing in the privacy policy rather than to just an unbundled privacy policy document. And so the CNIL case centres around two main issues. One, that the consent box is pre-ticked, and that's a big no-no as far as GDPR goes, and I think hope that you're all aware of that. If you do have a consent box on your website, and hope you do, please do make sure that the default situation isn't that it is pre-ticked because that is simply not allowed anymore. And no, you can go to some big name websites, including some high street names here in the UK, and find that the consent box is pre-ticked, but please ignore that. They are in the wrong. They are committing an offence, technically. So don't fall into that trap. Make sure that your consent box is blank and that users have to make a conscious decision to tick the box and give you consent for whatever it is you wish to do. And the other thing here is the CNIO is also saying that Google have buried their privacy policy away amongst all their other policies, which makes the document so big and so long that like most people, I guess, and I know I've done that, you just, just scroll down through it and through it and through it and get bored and get to the bottom and you tick the box and you say, yeah, I'm happy with all of that. And you're not really sure what it is you've just said you're happy to. And it shouldn't be like that. The policy should be a distinct document. So again, the other lesson there for everyone listening to this is make sure that you have your privacy policy, your GDPR compliant privacy policy, 
And if you're not sure if your privacy policy is GDPR compliant, then please do get in touch with us at Insurity and we will carry out a quick check for you and let you know whether it is or is not GDPR compliant. And if it's not, I'll tell you what you need to do to make it GDPR compliant. But the important thing above all of that is making sure that your privacy policy is a very distinct document away from your terms and conditions. It can't be buried in with 101 other things that you want your clients to sign up to. So some useful lessons there, I think, for everyone. And we wait and see what the outcome of Google's appeal is. And of course, we'll bring you the outcome of that appeal as soon as it's known. And uh, we'll doubtless come back to that in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Alongside Google, the other company, of course, which we mentioned more than once on the GDPR Weekly Show is Facebook. Uh, But just to say, perhaps proving the old adage that no news is bad news, um, Facebook don't actually appear to be suffering too much as a result of the fines which have been imposed upon them. Uh, Indeed, they're now saying that their number of monthly active users in Europe is now higher than before GDPR came into effect. And not only are they getting more users, but the revenue per user has increased. Their average revenue per user has jumped from $8.86 in quarter four of 2017 to $10.98 in quarter four of 2018, an increase of 24%. What that means for their European operation overall is that their European revenue has jumped from 3.25 billion in quarter four 2017 up to 4.15 billion in quarter four 2018, an increase of 28%. Um, And so perhaps they can well afford those fines that have been imposed on them. but hopefully they're learning the lessons and that Facebook will become more GDPR compliant as time goes on. Check us out on Facebook. Just a reminder that as well as the podcast, we now have our own Facebook group. Please do pop along and see us there at https colon slash slash www.facebook.com slash groups slash GDPR weekly show. That's always one word, GDPR weekly show. And, uh, do please come and join the group and follow the discussions that are going on. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. One of our listeners um, approached us this week because they approached their bank, one of the uh, big high street banks here in the UK, and because they'd not had an account with them, since 2011 they thought they'd check whether they were still on the database so they popped into their local branch of the bank and gave their details and found that the bank did still have all their details on file despite this last account being closed almost eight years ago and so the person our listener um, said to the bank that they wish to exercise their right to be forgotten. And to their surprise, the bank said, sorry, no can do, because it's our policy to keep details for 10 years. And the bank, we had to explain to our listener that in this instance, the bank was quite right, because As perhaps we've said before in episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show, and certainly we mentioned in our training, that the right to be forgotten is not an absolute right. You can request to be forgotten, but if the organisation for which you are requesting the data to be forgotten has a data retention policy, and that data retention policy is documented, and it can be documented to say they're going to keep all their information for 10 years, as it was in the case of this bank, could in fact be any period up to 100 years. Um, But as long as it's a documented decision, it's been a clear decision, it's not just a whim, 
and there's a logic behind their decision, then they're perfectly entitled to have that as their retention policy, and hey, you might want to be deleted as much as you want, but you have no right to be deleted under GDPR. And it's one area where I think the right to be forgotten is perhaps one of the most misunderstood parts of the uh, act, and with hindsight, maybe the people drafting the act would have been better described in it as uh, the right to request to be forgotten. So in this instance, the bank involved were quite within their rights, and we thought we'd carry out a little more to see how widespread this was. So we had a brief chat with um, the Financial Conduct Authority, who oversee banks and financial uh, institutions, and they said that they felt that 10 years was a perfectly reasonable time to keep the information, and so they agreed with us and with the bank that the bank was right. Um, so just something worth bearing in mind, if you don't yet have a data retention policy and you'd like some help in drawing one up, then please do get in touch with us here at Insurity. Uh, as always, I either go by our website or email us at uh, podcasts at insurity.co.uk, E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y.co.uk, and we'd be very pleased to help you put a data retention policy together to make sure that you have everything you need to uh, deal with requests to be forgotten from any of your clients or indeed suppliers or indeed employees. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. A Portuguese hospital group um, has been fined by the Portuguese ICO, uh, the CMPD, who fined the hospital €400,000 uh, because they carried out a audit of the hospital's IT system and found that it was insecure. The system allowed staff to access patient records by using false profiles. Uh, the full audit by the CMPD is yet to be made public, but it's been widely reported that despite the hospital having just under 300 doctors, who should have had access to the system, the system itself had almost a thousand registered profiles on it. Um, the hospital has already announced that it's intending to appeal the level of the fine. But again, it's an interesting example of how we're seeing fines now right across Europe, um, moving into a realm where perhaps under old data protection regulations we never saw them being. You know, because we've now seen fines of half a million pounds here, 400,000 euros in Portugal, uh, 50 million euros, of course, in uh, Doodle's case in France. And so a whole new spectrum of fines, and perhaps it sets the landscape for the penalties we can expect to see in the post-GDPR world. And we will, of course, bring you updates on fines throughout the year here on the GDPR Weekly Show, and it'll be interesting to see if in a year's time we're still seeing fines of this sort of magnitude, or whether these fines are intended to act as a deterrent. Um, too early to tell, I guess, but we'll keep you updated in upcoming episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us and Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember to keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook. The GDPR Weekly Show is an Insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.